My name is Jack Burgess, and I started researching the Yosemite Valley Railroad in 1967. The railroad ran from Merced, California, to the western boundary of Yosemite National Park. It was completed in 1907 and ran until 1945. In the mid-1970s, I sent a letter to Bob Luno, who had been a brakeman on the YV for five months beginning in August 1942, and introduced myself. That began years of writing letters, asking questions, followed by long telephone calls, asking more questions. The following is an interview with Bob in 1989. I was only 19 years old. I was a rail fan from uh, the early 30s. I think the Chicago uh, World's Fair uh, was where the bug bit. And uh, from that date on, well, that's all I wanted to do. So, uh, and I guess railroad out west always looked better than railroad in the east. So the only way I could do it was to write a bunch of letters to all the little wooden axle railroads in the west, like the White Pass in Yukon and the Sumter Valley and the Nevada County Narrow Gauge, all these big carriers. And the Yosemite Valley was one of them, and they were the only one that answered in a positive tone. The rest of them, they, they suggested I find employment elsewhere. I was living in New York at the time, and uh, in fact, I had just got a job with American Optical Company down on 42nd Street in the mailroom, and I worked there one day, and it was highlighted by sending some Manhattan Island mail out with a uh, Paraguayan uh, stamp on them, you know, about two dollars, and I must have sent about Oh, half a mailbag, it seems, of uh, flyers out to the people in New York City with enough postage to go to Paraguay. And uh, so I, it was a time for me to leave after that one day. And uh, that night when I went home, well, there was a letter from Mr. White, and he says, if, you'll, uh, if you want to work in the shop as a, as a machinist helper, and then we'll try to work you in as a brakeman if an opening occurs. We started out in the shops uh, wiping engines, and uh, the way that they worked it, why uh, you got a bucket of pearl oil, they called it. I've never found out what pearl oil is, uh, but they all knew what it was. It looked like a kind of a mixture of diesel fuel and kerosene, and uh, that's what you dipped your waste in, and you softened up the grease on the drivers or wherever you were cleaning. They cleaned the whole thing. You know, the frame, the, the drivers, the, the jacket, everything. The idea back of cleaning it like that isn't just cleanliness, I mean, just for show, it's to see if there's cracks and things of that sort. And then you'd have a, a, an old power hacksaw blade uh, broken off and ground off flat. That was your scraper. So you'd, uh, you'd just sit and, or stand and climb and wash those buggers down from one end to the other. I was the only kid in the shop, other than uh, wiping engines and helping the, the uh, machinists uh, in the pit, you know, that was a nasty job. You got the nasty jobs, and then, like, cleaning the front end out of the little, uh, the 22 and the, and the 23, uh, it's a tight squeeze when you'd open the smoke box door on the 23, it'd hit the, it'd hit the handrails around the pumps. So they needed a skinny kid to clean, to get in there, and <laughs> and, and bail out the carbon. So uh, that was another job. But it was. It was a first rate, top notch, grade A, small operation. Very small. Everything was neat as a pin. Really, I uh, you just can't imagine how neat it was. And uh, in fact, if you ever got Mr. White or Mr. Uh, Wood uh, ticked off about anything, why, then you'd, he'd tell you to sweep the floor. And of course, it's a dirt floor. And boy, you could sweep forever. If they wanted to drop the wheels, they had a drop pit where they'd, uh, and boy, that was Grease City. You never saw such a horrible mess in your life down in there. They, everything was covered with with oily grease and stuff, and uh, there was a thing like a gas station hydraulic hoist on a little track down in there. And uh, 
you raise this thing up under the axle and, and then uh, they could take out a section of the track and drop this thing, drop the wheels down in and then you'd move the thing out and then raise it up and they'd be, uh, you know, free to use or whatever they're going to do to it, put new tires on her. I, uh, I got a kick out of watching the guy work the steam hammer too. They had a blacksmith there that, boy, he was good. And uh, one of the big problems with log cars was that the uh, the arch bar would crack right uh, next to the to the spring plank or uh, at the bottom, you know, close to the spring group. And uh, this I found out was a a problem uh, the world over with arch bar trucks is when they when they fail, that's where they fail. And if you look at the at the the weight of the metal. The arch bar will be like an inch and a quarter, and the and the bottom strap will be maybe uh, three quarters of an inch or something. Like, you know, they won't be the same di or thickness for all three uh, uh, structural members. And uh, of course, that you got to bend that sucker. See, well, it comes, you know, it comes straight. Uh, and uh, they have a steam hammer, and you get that thing red hot, and then it start banging in. <laughs> He had a conniption. I was helping hold the thing, and, and uh, just before the hammer came down, he saw I had my hand on it. He said, boy, get your hand off of there, you know. <laughs> the vibration, I'd be, my teeth would be chattering yet if I'd have hung on to that thing when that hammer hit that, hit that uh, arch bar. Hank Loggins, who was one of the brakemen on the final train, he was a fine fellow. He was on the first student trip that I made. And I, I walked in the caboose, and he says, well, here's the broom. He says, this is the first thing you got to learn to do, was sweep out the caboose. So that's what I did. My first pay trip was quite, uh, when I look back on it, it was, you know, what a deal. Uh, it was uh, the head brakeman on the, on the passenger train. And here you had to have clean white shirt and clean overalls and, and these black half sleeves and the equipment was a little 440 and that little shorty RPO car and the observation car, you know, what a perfect train to start out on uh, for a rail fan turned railroader. It was ideal. Well, that's the only time I ever worked a darn job because uh, those guys didn't lay off much. And uh, then I worked the local a few times. Uh, that was, uh, those local jobs were okay, but um, the crew expected you to know more than I did. And uh, I wasn't too popular for the first couple of trips. And I don't know, you know, they want you to be born with experience and seniority, and it doesn't work that way. And I kept my mouth shut, but I was tempted to sound off at times, but uh, it worked out all right. But those were those were nice trips because uh, they were a little more they were varied. You didn't know just exactly what you were going to do all the time. Whereas the log train was uh, pretty much a rubber stamp. And uh, I think that on the west local, I never worked the east local. Made a student trip on it, but I, uh, in fact, the the guys on the east local were a separate group from the guys on the west local. They lived in El Portel, and. Uh, there were times when I don't think they, uh, the guys in the, at Merced thought too much of the people out on the West End or the East End. You switched in Merced. Uh, that's the first thing you did on the, uh, on the local. I went to work, I don't know, around 2.30 or 3 o'clock, something like that. I think that we, the, the plan usually was that you'd leave Merced after the passenger train got in. Because, see, they'd come in there around quitting time. It'd be around 5 something, 5 o'clock, 4, 4.49 or something like that. And they'd go down to the depot and then they'd back around the Y and then the, log, the local would, uh, would leave. The first night I was on a student trip on the upper local you know, trying to be helpful and all that. And we had one of those old cars that I'd fooled with around the shop. We'd worked on it. And I knew the drawbar didn't work. The knuckle wouldn't come out, see. So 
So here old man Gibbons, the conductor on the upper local, he's pulling on this thing, trying to get it to, to uh, open up, and, and uh, the cars are about four feet apart. And I said, here, I'll get the other one, and I walked between the cars. See, you know, old Gibbons, he just about died. And uh, about 20 seconds later, I found out why, then the slack all ran out and the cars came together. <laughs> I figure I don't think I'll do that anymore. The log train only put its own train away. It didn't do anything else. And uh, this West Local did all the, the warehouse and the sawmill switching. Then, depending on what the time was and how the guys on the East End were doing, they would uh, perhaps change the meat from Merced Falls to uh, Star or Detweiler uh, or drum, places like that. And then you'd go up into the hills, and uh, by that time it's dark, of course, and you'd meet them up there, and what would happen was you'd just swap trains, and uh, they'd go back with your train, and you'd go on into Merced Falls, and then you'd have to switch to town again if there was any, if they had any uh, logs, you had to put them away. Uh, it was seldom, if ever, did they have anything other than logs from Merced Falls. The only awkward part about that was, uh, as I later found out, was that when you worked the local, that Dutch drop, the head brakeman had a different job than on the lo a log train. And it was a tough enough affair to figure out anyhow, and then you had to learn both tricks. And on the, on the local, you'd ride the, it was the head brakeman's job to to ride the cut and pinch them down so they didn't roll into snelling. And uh, the other man, he, uh, the hind man, he's the guy that did the, the gate throwing. And uh, this kind of screwed me up for a while because I was used to riding the engine on that deal. And uh, it takes a lot of muscle to screw down those, those damn log cars. And you can't run over empty cars like in the daytime, see? You're, uh, there's logs, so you only got one car, and if you don't pinch that sucker down right proper, and you need another car, the only thing you can do is hop off and catch it, the next one when it comes by, see? And uh, that led for some exciting moments. When you look back and think about some of the, the highlights of the thing, I always think that when the local had to meet somebody uh, up the line, say up at Star or Drum, then you'd, you'd come back down to Merced Falls. The rule was you had to decorate. And uh, that always appealed to me, sitting up on that boxcar and just kind of loafing down the hill. You know, they'd only go about 10 miles an hour, it seemed like, to go down the hill because they'd had all that rock behind them. And that was a pretty good uh, uh, jag of weight for that. Uh, you have about 25 carload of rock. It was nice on a moonlit night to sit there and hear that engine popping and farting up there, you know, the, the fire out the bottom, and you know, all you'd hear would be the, the pumps uh, chugging away and the generator whining, and it was nice, That's, I'm telling you now. And then when we get to Merced Falls, as I say, we'd get rid of the log cars if we had any, and uh, go on into uh, Merced. Well, you'd go to the cement plant switch, and the rocks were on the back end as a rule, because they usually have your head end cars with uh, any local freight that you have or anything from that uh, national lead up there. That'd be up next to the engine because you would have left uh, El Portel with just a very short train. And so the rock would be behind that. Well, rather than take that head end car all the way up the uh, to the cement plant, you'd shove the rock cars up the spur and then go back to the main with the, with the head end cars. And then you'd have to come back and pick up the rock cars again and shove them to the uh, cement plant, which was about a mile away. And uh, uh, one night, why, uh, those couplers, you know, were built just shortly after the ark, and they had a chain pin puller. And you couldn't very well gauge if the pin was down by looking at it because it, one link looks like another. And uh, on one night I, I backed into them and I backed the train up, you know, and we're 
going along and I'm riding on the engine on the tender. And uh, old Jay Swineford, the engineer, who was as old as Methuselah, he'd get in the engine, he'd never get off it all day long. He was <laughs> a real old guy. And uh, what a fine fellow. And uh, he got a little upset with me that night because when he eased off, why well, the cars kept going, the pin hadn't dropped, see, and I watched the gap grow and the air hose straighten out, and I figured, boy, when that sucker straightens out, those damn cars are going to dynamite, and this engine is going to slam in, <laughs> and I'm going to be all through railroading. And, and so I was able to swing them down violently, and he big hold his engine, and uh, just about the time the cars opened up, and they big hold themselves, but... Uh, they never came together, so I could hear him in his kindly old way muttering up there about the poor state of the brakeman that he was getting these days. So I backed him up and hooked him up again. Then, of course, we had to pump all those damn cars up again. It took a seemed like an eternity, and uh, away we this time. And then, of course, I tested him on the pin, and that that aggravated him even worse. You know, after he pulled in, I made him go ahead a little. You know, well here this old man is got this Armstrong reverse bar and he's got a horse that sucker over and he's muttering up there. <laughs> Good thing I was enough of a politician to charcoal him along and then when you got to the cement plant you had to watch your step because if for some reason you had one more car than you were supposed to, you'd shove that rascal off the end of the spur. And that happened once and you know the end of that spur was about 30 feet in the air because it, it was a gravity affair. And you had to be a pretty good engineer because you had to hit that damn thing at a pretty good gate and then stop them on a dime up at the top. And uh, this one time I think they had an extra car and boy, they, right off the end it went. But uh, I was spared that uh, happening. I've left uh, Incline uh, with just a caboose and you could hear that sucker whistling up the canyon. And he whistled profusely letting you know he's coming. He was kind of a here I come uh, and I'm better than you so get out of the way. He was that kind of a guy. And you didn't even want to stand near the switch when he went by. He says you better get about three car lengths from that switch because he's afraid he'll throw it right in his face. I've worked on a couple places where they wide equipment and uh, the wide track is always like the, uh, it's the worst maintained track on the railroad. So you don't want the engine to get way down the tail of one of them. And so uh, every, like on the M and St. L when I worked there, we always backed around the wides there too because that way the engine would never have to go down the tail track any further than absolutely necessary. You know, because that track was pretty long for turning uh, log trains. But, uh, and undoubtedly it was all still in place. But boy, I bet it was pretty ratty back there. I never went back because we only had the engine and caboose when we backed around it. I can see uh, pushing those Pullmans around that tight curve uh, would have been a kind of a, a scary thing, I would think, because they have a tendency to uh, like daisy chain off of there, you know. You see, another reason why it was a good plan to back around that Y was that I think it was downhill when you backed around it. And the cars uh, would be kind of coasting down the hill. They wouldn't be pulling on each other. And uh, cause that's awful tight curve for those big cars. And they made no exception. They'd handle any damn Pullman that came along. And uh, so uh, this way they got turned around without any aggravation. And I think that's why the, the tank was down there, see? I don't recall if the passenger train took water. I would imagine that they did. They just, when they came off the wire, they probably just went down there and, and uh, grabbed a tank of water because they got to get it sometime and there they are. See, they had friction bearings in all the cars, and when you'd have a, a hot box or one that's warming up, they'd hang what you'd call a keely on the car. And this was a tank with water in it, 
and it had a hose and you just open the journal box lid and, and you fasten the hose in there and, and it would just kind of drip in there and keep that sucker cool enough so you could get to some place where you could set it out or take it into Merced Falls that way. And I, I just figured, it was, you know, a Keeley that's made by the Keeley Company someplace. And then after the war, why, I, uh, I had to go and take a physical uh, after I was discharged. And they sent me to Dwight, Illinois. And uh, I went in there and my gosh, it's the Keeley Institute. And I figured, what in the hell is this? And, and it turned out that the Keeley was a drunk rehabilitation deal back in the in the early days. And the cure was a water cure. And so I think that this tank got the name of a Keeley because that was the popular way to cure somebody was to just pour water on them. And I don't think it was made by the Keeley company at all. I think, <laughs> I think that was just a, a clever uh, name that they hung on it. Oh yeah, well it looked like a one of these tanks that you, you carry uh, air in, you know, for uh, airing up a tire someplace remote from a pump. And uh, it's hung right off a grab iron. And I suppose it was maybe uh, two feet, three feet long and ten inches in diameter. It had this rubber hose on it, and you just drip it in there and keep that thing cool. Well, I remember one time we went up and, and they'd, uh, they'd burned a journal so bad that we had to change the wheels. And uh, that's hard to do on a carload of logs. And you gotta, well, with arch bar trucks, it's not too bad because you can just drop the bolts and, and uh, pull the journal boxes and the whole works out. You, know, you don't have to really tear on a regular car with cast trucks. That be, you couldn't do it out in the field. You didn't have to go out with a wrecker and put a new truck on it. But things were done in the most expeditious manner on the YV. They had all kinds of clever ways of dealing things. They claimed that up in the woods they used to move the cars by bumping them with the log. And, of course, uh, that could be done gently, but chances are it wasn't. So they took a terrific beating. They'd hit the bulkhead or hit the corners and, and uh, of course, uh, those sills are a misnomer because they don't carry any weight. The only reason they're there is to support the floor, which which doesn't do anything. It's amazing why those cars were made that way. They think they would have been made skeleton. When the log train would approach Bagby, it was time to inspect it because that was about halfway and we had to stop for water. And uh, the man on the engine would get off about 25 cars from town and observe the uh, front half of the train going past him. And then as soon as the train stopped, he'd cross over and, and walk up to the engine. At the same time, the, the rear man is, is walking toward the point where you got off. So the whole train would then be inspected. We were looking for broken uh, dragon beams or chains that were dragging, anything like that. And, uh, of course, when I'd get off, that they'd be going, it seemed to me, about 30 miles an hour. And uh, you'd have to have your feet running before you hit the ground. And uh, a couple of times I plowed into the right of way, and I figured I had to develop a better way of doing it than I was doing it. So I ran up this hill, and I, I'd run up about 25, 30 feet, and that would slow me down. And, I always thought it'd be amusing to come back someday and see this path that went halfway, went halfway up the hill and then just stopped. But I guess that's all underwater now. Then when we'd get down to Bagby, why well, they'd usually have, the, have their water, and uh, I'd go into the store there and get a couple of ice cream cones and, for the crew, and it was something to see me catch that engine going by with a handful of ice cream cones. It, uh, I got real good at it there. On the first one we got to Merced Falls, uh, the trick was to make up your train. And uh, you pick up the engine, and uh, the caboose track is right next to the turntable, and you put the caboose on the front end of the engine. 
and you'd reach in and grab a bunch of cars and uh, you back down on the main line with them. And the trick was to put the engine on the other end of the cars. So we'd shove the cars up to the, around the depot. And then you'd reverse the engine and start backing up just as fast as he could get her going in a short time there. Then he'd give me a little slack and I'd pull the pin. I'd be riding on the pilot by this time. And then the engine would uh, race away from these uh, rolling cars and get down to the switch that went back into the, to the, uh, the log spur. And this was a uh, trailing point switch, so the trick was to put the engine up the, the log spur without getting uh, creased by these cars coming at you. So you'd uh, hop off the engine, turn the switch, and the engine would uh, run up the log track, and, and then you'd line it back for the main line, and then the cars would hopefully have enough momentum to completely pass the switch. And uh, every time I was there, we, we did it successfully. But I can see where if you, if you didn't pull them fast enough and they died on you before the last car cleared the switch, then you'd be in a kind of a bad spot and you'd have to pull them back or do some trick. And then uh, uh, you'd, you'd pull that up and you'd have the engine on the proper end of the train. Because I, re I remember the last day it ran, there was a logistics problem of bringing in the engine. Because the fireman had his car. He, he was the automobile driver. So the, uh, the rear brakeman, uh, Bob Cohn, had also been a fireman. And he fired the thing back to Merced, uh, from Merced Falls, about the 29 in, in the caboose. That was the end of the, of the log train, I think. Uh, I think a few more cuts came down on the, uh, on the local because they undoubtedly were cleaning up up there. But uh, the last log train that I worked on was a full train. And, you know, it's inconceivable that that would be the end of the logs. Uh, maybe you, you think they would have trailed off. So maybe a few more cuts came down, but uh, there was no s seven and eight after that. What happened was I uh, was with J.K. Williams up at El Portel and, and uh, maybe it was in town, I don't know. At any rate, uh, I pulled the pin and didn't, you know, I had the angle cocks turned, which is normal procedure, and just uh, pulled the pin and moved him ahead and, and bang, you know, the air that's in the, in the hoses popped. And I didn't didn't strike anything with me. And next thing I know, there's Jakey standing on the ground. And uh, he come out of that cab like a spike had come up into the seat box. And, and don't you ever do that again. You know, you, you break the hose. Okay, okay. Then somebody told me that he, somebody else had done the same thing on one of the cabooses and the glad hands didn't open up. And they pulled the pipe clear out of the car, you know, from one end to the other. So. Uh, he, uh, he didn't want me doing that anymore. He was quite a guy. I remember he was making fun of somebody one time on a, on a, uh, on a bridge gang. And I thought, boy, this guy isn't very nice, you know. Come find out it's his brother. And, uh, but he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't tell you the, you know, he wouldn't tell you the full story. I was just thinking, you know, you talk about today's wages and all, nobody on the road made a dollar an hour. And uh, it was uh, it was 40 cents an hour in the shop, and I think it was 70 cents if you were breaking or firing, and 90 cents if you were an engineer and conductor. Like, like brakemen are wont to say, I can make you move that $100,000 engine with this $2 lantern, so watch your step. You ought to make some mention of Mr. White because he, uh, you know, he gave me the job out there and no one in his right mind would have done that. And then I found out that he gave jobs to lots of people that uh, were, let's face it, uh, unemployable as they now use the word. He'd give people jobs to get out of jail you know, if they needed a, they needed a job. 
And they didn't have to stay there any length of time, but they he'd say, yeah, he worked here, you know, and then they, he'd get a parole. I think the, you know, it was a it was a big change for for me. I was just 19 years old, and uh, it was my first work experience. Just the fact that uh, you were part of a of something that you'd always wanted to be in. I think that uh, I I tell you that was a there's a mystique about it in those days uh, that uh, I don't know if it exists today for the young folks or not, but it did for me and other people that I've talked with at that time. It, uh, it just kind of grabs you and you just won't let go. I know of an evening you'd be coming in from Merced Falls to Merced and you'd be uh, lumping along there, you know, the bright moon out, you know, and you'd look around and lean out the gangway and, and see the words Yosemite Valley written on the tender. And, and uh, you just kind of knew right then that you were really Railroad not west, uh, and nobody ever did it more than that. And that, uh, that was it, boy. <laughs>